So <clears throat> I'm going to do today a primer on uh, OB, and then this is my plug for tomorrow. I'm going to really do some definitions here, and then we'll go into a little more detail tomorrow. I have to say there's no disclosures, unfortunately. I have none. Um, but for the objectives, um, as I mentioned, we're going to talk about definitions, how things have changed in obstetrics, and uh, talk about where we are with trial of labor. There's some um, new data and uh, go over some risk factors of rupture, which we all get nervous about. And then at the end, um, go over the fetal heart rate tracings. So first, um, to talk about stages of labor, this is going to take you guys back probably to medical school. Um, we had uh, the stages of labor haven't changed. We have the first stage, a second stage, which everybody knows is the pushing, and then the third stage, which is the sadly forgotten one, which is the delivery of the placenta. <clears throat> Much of the stages of labor were developed by Dr. Friedman actually in the 1950s, and believe it or not, until recently, we continued to have these stages. But uh, the Friedman curve, as I said, was done in the 50s, back when fashion was different, and things were different in obstetrics. The majority of women had their child before 25 years of age. There was lower BMI. Uh, labor consisted, uh, labor analgesia consisted of light and heavy medication, and that's actually in uh, the 1950s article from Friedman. He basically just described it as light and heavy. There was no uh, evaluation of ethnicity. There was no evaluation other than just these were university patients and public um, patients, private or university. And so they defined abnormality very precisely. Nullips, if they changed less than 1.2 centimeters, multips, if they changed less than 1.5 centimeters. And you were considered active labor at four centimeters. So how did the first stage of labor change for us? It's not until the early 2000s that we actually looked at large databases. People started to realize that maybe our definitions were different, patient population is different, and we no longer maybe needed to abide by this four centimeter rule. I'll give you some data later on in the talk about what also was happening um, at the same time and what prompted people to look at that. But as we uh, looked at this data, it re we realized that the rate of cervical dilation accelerated after six centimeters, and so might the definition of active labor start really at six centimeters. So this is a graph that you can see, and if you look at for the Paris, so if a nullip, a P1 and a P2 and beyond, that slope of the graph changes really at, let's see, I think this is a pointer here. really at six centimeters. And so that prompted the new movement in obstetrics that six is the new four. And so another part of the obstetric world was dealing with, and as you and I all deal with, is the cesarean delivery, and which uh, Lawrence just talked about. Our C-section rates have been going up, you can see here, and total cesarean deliveries, again, going up and vaginal birth after C-section going down. And so this subsequently was happening at the same time that we were starting to evaluate this Friedman curve and the changes. So how could we prevent the first C-section? Well, if we're defining active labor at four centimeters, we're gonna start calling dysfunctional labor earlier. If we define it at six centimeters, which is based on the current data, maybe we can let women labor longer and prevent that diagnosis of um, active phase arrest. So more data looked at the normal labor progression, obviously found that latent labor is longer in induced labors, and the curves were very similar when you went from, if you were in spontaneous labor or whether you're being induced, at six centimeters, everybody looked very much the same. Um, so arrest of labor should really be diagnosed well after six centimeters. If you're going to have a woman who's being induced, you really shouldn't diagnose it until they're well beyond six centimeters. And most of, as you can see there, spontaneous labor and induction of labor had their C-sections performed before six centimeters. 
which brought the issue of why we were starting to see more C-sections. So to move on to the second stage of labor, we think of that as the pushing stage. So in someone who arrests in the, the first stage of labor, your really only option if they're not going to advance in dilation is to head to, as I call it with the residents, the big white room for the C-section. But in the second stage of labor, you have a couple different options. Obviously, we hope they have a spontaneous vaginal delivery, but there's also the operative vaginal delivery. And then, of course, always the cesarean. <clears throat> I'm going to mention for um, tomorrow, this is my plug for you guys to come to my talk tomorrow. I'm going to get into more details on how we can do these um, ad advanced vaginal deliveries with the forceps um, and sort of the complications that we'll see of it. But the obstetrician at this point is going to evaluate the uh, potential for an operative vaginal delivery. And they're also going to evaluate um, after the movement is to wait more than three hours before they call the, the cesarean delivery for um, active phase or for arrestive descent in the second stage. And the reason for that is actually really critical because cesarean deliveries in the second stage, as you guys all know and have experienced, are a much more morbid procedure. The studies have shown you have more uh, maternal and neonatal morbidity, there's higher blood loss more hysterotomy extensions, more need for transfusions, and because of that, you have more admissions to the ICU. Delivery of the neonate is incredibly challenging, especially if, if a mom has been pushing for a while or the head is wedged into the pelvis, and so therefore you're also gonna have more admission to the NICU. And so why is that? So I have to say some of the most challenging deliveries that I did as an obstetrician were these second stage deliveries. You basically make the uterine incision and the fetal head is wedged further down and you actually have to pry it up almost like a suction cup and that's sort of what that sound is as you're trying to get the, the neonate delivered. And so we've tried different techniques to try to help with that, but it can be a very challenging case and you can have either inadvertent hysterotomy extensions which you have to repair or um, intentional ones just to try to deliver the, the neonate. So a group met in, uh, at the NIH to um, talk about really why we should, how many C-sections we're doing and how can we prevent that and how can we really define what arrest and failed uh, inductions are. And so they came up with these uh, strong criteria. And you can see for most of these, they have pretty much go with what we've talked about already, which is failed induction really have to wait at least 24 hours. and they talk about oxytocin administration and if feasible artificial rupture of membrane should happen before you're calling this a failed induction and moving to section. For the first stage arrest, they have two different definitions and they really um, allow you to really push longer and wait and don't make that diagnosis until they're at least uh, six centimeters um, and that they have adequate forces. So they measure that in monovideo units. The second stage arrest, again, um, really looking at pushing for at least three hours. And it is only when you get to two hours in a multiparist without an epidural. So a multiparous woman should, um, at the minimum, have uh, two hours, but many places we will, in, in our institution, will have them push much longer. So I'm going to turn now to the third stage of labor, which I uh, think is quite important, and we've all experienced um, the placenta and the complications with the placenta. So I'm going to just talk about this just as a definition, and then tomorrow, again, we're going to go over all of the various ways we can help and intervene with this. But we definitely, it's not over till it's over. So you can have a retained placenta, uterine inversion, and obviously postpartum hemorrhage. And so in, in obstetrics, they looked at um, the idea of active management of the third stage to reduce the postpartum hemorrhage. And um, actually, there's been several uh, RCTs done on and Cochrane has uh, put together uh, all of these and has a consensus that actually giving oxytocin just before the, not waiting till the placenta is delivered and um, just after the cord is clamped can actually reduce your uh, chances of 
having a postpartum hemorrhage. And interestingly, one of the biggest concerns people have is, well, wouldn't that cause retained placenta? It's actually not been shown. We tend to do this as well when uh, in cesarean deliveries, when the cord is clamped, we start our Pitocin. And so we are, in effect, actively managing the third stage as well. So with that, I want to turn our attention to a really important topic that affects both the obstetric community and us, really. Um, it's a trial of labor after cesarean. So we like to call that the TOLAC. So just for um, definition purposes, TOLAC and VBAC kind of get used interchangeably. But if a woman is attempting to have a vaginal delivery after her C-section, she's trying to TOLAC. If she successfully does that, then we say she had a successful VBAC or vaginal birth after C-section. So looking at the patterns here, we can see <clears throat> early on, um, really there wasn't many vaginal births, but really that was because vaginal birth after C-section because we didn't have that many C-sections. As the time went on, our C-section rate was climbing and at right here, you start to see it drop, and that coincides with ACOG's guidelines saying, in order for an institution to offer a trial of labor, they have to have um, staff immediately available, and that includes us. So anesthesia, obstetricians, and nursing. For the concern of, obviously, uterine rupture, and what that resulted in is redu reduction in places offering trial of labor. So in 1970, the C-section rate is 5%, which is astonishing. We're never going to get back to that for various reasons. And part of those are, um, have to do with we're not doing as many operative vaginal deliveries. We're also not um, we're, we're having patients, as we mentioned, doing um, they're a much older population. The um, force of deliveries are not done at a high uh, station. But in 2011, the rate went up to 35%. And so the goal, um, which ACOG would love, um, and I think we would all like too, is to get down to 20%. Um, this is a problem because the goal is to prevent the first C-section and also be able to offer for those women who have to have a C-section a trial of labor. So they've liberalized who can be offered a trial of labor. At first was if you had one previous lower uterine scar, you could have one, but now they said, ACOG has said two previous in 2012. So this is just uh, some more data on looking at a third of the deliveries, as we know, are delivered via cesarean. And uh, we do have a reduction of trial of labors. And over 90% of the women who have a primary C-section will have a repeat. A um, multi-center uh, trial was done to look at, you know, could this be achieved? 40% of the women still in latent, labor, late, latent phase of labor after 12 hours of oxytocin and ARAM delivered vaginally. So this is possible if we can actually just allow women to labor longer and have institutions able to offer it. So what's our success rate? Overall, it's 60 to 80 percent. This is an example of the labor calculator that's available online. It's in um, perinatology website, which is a free website that any woman can go to, and they can plug in some numbers. So the important thing to note is there's certain things that reduce your percent uh, chance of being successful. That is for not entirely clear African American, Latinos, um, if you had a vaginal delivery, um, or if you had a prior C-section for arrestive dilation or descent, that's going to lower it. Obviously, if your BMI is higher. Um, if you have shorter interval between your first and second pregnancy, that also reduces it. So what are the issues surrounding trial of labor? You have to be at a facility where you can have one where you have resources available, where you have um, ability to respond to obstetrical emergencies. And again, we still have this issue of immediately available because we're always worried about the most serious risk, which is the uterine rupture. And it's a risk for both uh, the neonate and the maternal. So what is the risk? And this has been looked at many large uh, studies looking retrospectively. And it 
runs anywhere from 0.5% to 1%. So it's not a large risk, but it is still a risk. The things that we can be done um, are double layer closures, obviously not offering um, a trial of labor to any woman who had a classical, which is making an incision into the active segment of the uterus, or even teeing the incision. Those risks of rupture can go up to almost 10%. Obviously having fetal heart rate monitoring and the ability to respond, because there is signs of uterine rupture with fetal heart rate monitoring. So when you think about that, um, we looked at, in California, who is able to have a trial of labor, and we surveyed a group um, of all of the, across California, all of the different hospitals. And here's a map to kind of show you. <clears throat> so San Francisco, you can imagine, green means that they have a trial of labor, and gray is they don't offer a trial of labor. So a lot of, a lot of green there. And in Los Angeles, there's a lot of green, but even surprisingly, you know, it's, Los Angeles is big and there's still a lot of gray. And obviously here, Central Valley, a lot of gray. So the question becomes, what, who has access to trial of labor and who has the resources? Some patients will travel from um, an outside area out in these areas and come to San Francisco to have a trial of labor. But if you're an individual who lacks resources, funds, ability to be transported um, on their own to a facility, they're gonna just have a, a repeat C-section. And that will happen time and time again. And if they're gonna have a big family, they will have multiple C-sections, which increases their risk and we'll talk about in a moment for um, placental uh, accreta. What one institution did was had a novel idea of looking at the resources that they had and also looking at um, the ability to use different um, models. And there is the midwifery model at Marin General, which is just across the bay. They have their own midwifery service that is essentially a separate group that does all of their deliveries and they have an in-house laborist that works on a shift that is just there for backup. In addition, they have private practice group that is um, MD only's. And that group, um, the way it was done before 2011 was the midwifery group saw all of the um, public medical insurance patients and the private practice in group saw all of the insured patients. If you were a private insured patient, you weren't able to go to the midwifery group. After 2011, they changed that, and they said anyone who had private insurance, they could actually make their choice of going to a midwifery group, or they could go stay with MD only group. So it is Marin, and of course many women decided they wanted to go to the midwifery practice. And you can see this was analyzed by one of our uh, maternal fetal medicine um, attendings at UCSF, looking at what the change, what, what happened with this change. So you can see at the time of the expansion, this is the private practice group of patients. The privately insured patients changed and went to their midwifery. And with this expansion, they decreased their C-section rates. And so having a different model um, made a huge difference in their overall C-section rate. And the midwifery group was able to do this because they have a backup system set up so that there's a laborist there at all times to be able to do a C-section if necessary. And obviously they have 24-7 uh, coverage with anesthesia. So what are the benefits <clears throat> of the trial of labor? So if it's successful, obviously you can see the benefits there. The most um, significant complications that you have in cesarean deliveries come from the failed trial of labor. So you really see a much more complicated cesarean delivery in a patient who wasn't able to actually make it to successfully be back. And you can see those complications there. So it's not something to be taken lightly and we have to be obviously prepared for that. But the um, more complicated C-sections are those, the, the failed TOLAX. There's also some long-term benefits of being able to successfully have a VBAC, 
and that's really preventing these long-term complications of cesarean delivery. So obviously chronic pain um, from repetitive uh, surgical procedures, adhesions, the risk of infertility or subfertility. You obviously have um, a dose response between the number of C-sections and the risk of accreta. And um, obviously there's perinatal complications with repeats. So what's our role in this? Obviously we're there in case there's any um, emergent delivery needed for uterine rupture. We're um, there to provide epidural analgesia for the women who are attempting to do a trial of labor. And epidural analgesia has been associated with um, high success of VBACs. There's things that we, um, we know it doesn't mask uterine rupture, but things that have been um, indicated to be associated with uterine rupture or wound dehiscence of increased top-offs. Um, obviously, we need to be concerned if a patient is asking for top-offs and having increased uterine pain between contractions that's not relieved by these epidural boluses. And we often um, have had patients who have presented with that very situation, and that brings us together with the obstetricians to say we're concerned about this, and, and we've actually delivered patients because of that and have seen um, small areas of dehiscence. So I'm just going to talk for a moment about trial of labor with induction, because that's a little bit different. And one of the successful uh, trial of labor patients are the ones that come in in spontaneous labor, but we always question, what do we do with the induction patients? The patients that are getting to be post-dates, that are not in labor yet, do we induce them or do we just schedule them for the repeat C-section? So it, that's about 28% of the women with prior cesarean delivery. They do have a lower possibility of success, um, and things that we, can, we get concerned about are high doses of oxytocin. So if they're increasing during their induction, we have to increase the rate of oxytocin. They have a slightly higher risk of rupture than the, the half to 1%. We also have limited options on how we can induce them. We cannot use prostaglandins, no mesoprostol, no Silverdale, because those are, have a much higher rate and are, their one absolute contraindication for their use is someone who's had a prior scar. So that leaves us with the Foley balloon. Um, it's actually used both in the trial of labor patients, but also in patients who are getting induced for post-dates without a prior, previous scar. So what is that? Um, it's basically a Foley balloon. Um, this one is 30 cc's. We use 60 cc's at UC. You basically put it through the external os, through into the internal os, and dilate it up and put it on tension. It looks kind of like a torture device, um, but what it provides is some mechanical dilation, and the idea is that it's going to release lo local prostaglandins um, from the cervix, and that can help dilate where we can't use our, um, the uh, usual mesoprostol or cervidil. So those are the options, just knowing that when you have a patient that has a uh, induction with a previous scar, we need to be mindful of those patients and kind of keep track of what's happening with them. This is something I wanted to mention um, just as a, an example. You can see, I think we all, all know this and have seen it, the increasing rates of um, accretas with these repeat cesarean deliveries. And here you can just see a mean morbidity score, it just increases with the number of deliveries and our odds ratios. It's a classic dose response. So obviously the more C-sections a person has, the higher risk they are for accretas. And that, as you know, is a quite morbid procedure. So with that, um, we've talked about the trial of labor and you can obviously see my um, push for being able to offer this. I'm going to turn to another topic that I think is, could be its own topic, but um, we'll kind of touch on fetal heart rate tracing, because this is key in when we evaluate all of our patients that are in labor, and for us to be able to understand and at least eyeball what's a tracing that I'm okay with or a tracing that I think I need to worry about and hear more about and ask the obstetricians how those patients are doing. I just lost this. Uh -oh. Ooh. Sorry, uh oh. <laughs> Computer failure.
Just put the, yeah, fetal heart rate. Can I click it through? Okay, here. Okay, I'm gonna go through, so. All right, I'm gonna talk ooh, quickly here. Let's see. So it's basically, as you guys know, it's a non-invasive way to try to measure hypoxia in the neonate and uh, predict acidemia. So we characterize it by um, looking at these uh, four categories, the baseline, the variability, and the presence or absence of decelerations. And then obviously we need to define what those decelerations are. This um, you guys will have in your slide set is basically the terminology that has been designed by the, NI, um, the NIH. They had an NICHD meeting group, working group to discuss this. Um, and so we'll, um, I, I leave those to you. They're just the nitty gritty of how we have to define everything. And this is so that we can actually interpret the tracings. So the big crux of this is how do we interpret these and what do we do with the information? So once we interpret it, um, the US decided they were gonna come up with three categories, category one, two, and three tracings. However, the European group said, well, we should probably delineate more and let's have five. The Europeans um, said, we're gonna stick with our five. Um, the US said, let's just do three because five gets very complicated. Well, what ended up happening was everybody got lobbed into the category two tracing and everybody said in the obstetric community, what do we do with category two? We know what to do with one, we know what to do with category three, what do we do with category two? So they now broke it into three categories within category two, hence we have now the five category, but not to admit defeat, we're gonna still keep them as category one, two, and three and just make subgroups, so. But once we define it, what do we do? And so these are some um, color-coded schemes that we've um, developed, which once you categorize the two-tiered system, or the three-tiered system, you can basically put it into color coding and then management style. So you can see there you know, what, who needs to be available and what we need to do with these patients. And so for us, as Lawrence mentioned in the earlier talk, finding out who's got uh, concerning tracing and we wanna know about those patients and know what's going on with them and what, what their, whether their risk of, of having a C-section urgently or emergently is. These are some conservative measures which basically are what we talk about when we think about intrauterine resuscitation. This is the intrauterine resuscitation. So I'm just gonna, with this last um, bit of time here, just go over good tracings, it's all about visualization. Great tracing, moderate variability, accelerations. Not a good tracing, okay? So this is someone that's having late decelerations, late in timing with the contractions. Variability is still moderate, so we're okay with doing some intrauterine resuscitation there. You can see Pitocin's off and IV's open. Um, but this is a tracing you're gonna wanna know about if this is a patient on your labor floor. Also, this patient you're gonna wanna know about. So this is minimal variability, with a little bit of a late there, but so minimal variability, you wanna know about this patient and this patient. This is one with severe repetitive variables. These are the patients that, again, aren't necessarily gonna be running off to the OR. As Lawrence mentioned, there's time, but not much, and you wanna know who these patients are and, when, and, and what the plan is and what what the obstetricians are doing and where they are in their labor course. So with that, um, things that, uh, just to recap, we've changed the definitions of labor. Um, we are trying to push to have more vaginal deliveries and those that can't have a vaginal delivery, we'd like to be able to have them with their second delivery uh, do a trial of labor. And fetal heart rate tracings are quite important for us to know about any concerning ones and there's some interpretations there for you.